Amen. Well, there are three great families of music. There's the Jackson Five, the Osmonds, and now the Witherell. So thank you very much. You were wonderful. Hey, children are dismissed. There's the sign in the back. Children are dismissed to Children's Church. Of course, you're welcome to stay if you want to hear a good sermon, kids. Hey, kids, it's going to be good. Either way, parents, you can keep them, you can send them, whatever is comfortable for you. The rest of us, let's stand up, grab your Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Hebrews today, the book of Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to do verses 19 to 25 together. Of course, as we stand, we're, we're reminded that the Bible is holy, it is inspired, it is inerrant, it is the authority of our lives. So when we read the Word of God, we are literally listening to the thoughts of God, the commands of God the teachings of God. Hebrews 10, verse 19 says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Did you hear that? He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Father, that great day is drawing near, the day in which you will judge the world, the day in which your son will come back to reign and to rule, the, the day in which all the thoughts of our hearts will be exposed, and those who love you will be justified and forgiven of all sins, and those who turn their backs on you will be condemned. That great day is approaching. Therefore, let us not neglect the gathering together to encourage one another. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Well, it's a lot to get it all together to, uh, to get to church on Sunday mornings, isn't it? And it's hard. There's the breakfast and there's the laying out of all the outfits and the ironing and if you have kids, that just makes it more complicated based on how many children you have in your family. But what I want you to do is, I want you to pretend you're going to church uh, in the past. Let's get in a time machine. We're, we're going to church now in the past. Don't go all the way back to the 1950s. We're not going to get into our Chevy Bel Air and head, head to the local, the local congregation. Instead, we're going to go all the way back to 900 B.C., and we're going to go to church together. We're going to get ready to go to church 900 B.C. So this is what it would have looked like, all right? If you got up at 9 o'clock today to make it here by 1030, uh, you're going to need to get up a little bit earlier because you've got to walk to church. And by the way, there isn't just a church on every street corner as there is today. There's churches everywhere. Uh, but back in 900 B.C., there was one church. There was the temple in Jerusalem, and that's where all of God's people were expected to go to worship. And so if you live in Bethlehem, that's no big deal because Bethlehem is only five miles away from Jerusalem. And you're going to walk there, and by the way, it's all uphill. How many of you went to school uphill both ways, right? Well, it really was five miles uphill. Jerusalem is the city on the hill. So if you're in Bethlehem, no big deal. Just get up when the sun rises. But if you lived in Nazareth, Nazareth is 75 miles away from Jerusalem. So you're going to have to get up like Wednesday in order to get to church on Sunday. And by the way, if you have kids, well, there's no such thing as strollers back 900 BC. So you probably better you probably better bring another shirt because with the temperatures soaring and those Middle Eastern climates, you're probably going to sweat out that shirt by the time you get there. You're going to need to change. And when you do finally make it to the temple, supposing that you don't get attacked by marauders or robbers or anything that, like that along the way, supposing you do actually make it to the temple, thank goodness you only had to go three times a year at the feast. You were required to go three times a year. 
Uh, but if you actually did make it to the temple, let's suppose, what wouldn't you find there? Well, you wouldn't find, first of all, an air-conditioned climate, as we have this morning. Y'all enjoying the air? Yeah, it feels pretty good. You wouldn't have a soft pew underneath you. You wouldn't be able to reach in front of you and pull out your pew Bibles because they didn't have pew Bibles back in those days. You wouldn't have the messages and the scriptures up for you on the big screen for your ease and convenience. You wouldn't have a nursery department. You wouldn't have taken care of the children. You wouldn't have flushing toilets. You wouldn't have running water. You wouldn't have lights. You would gather to the temple. And by the way, you better not come empty-handed because if you came 900 BC, you better bring blood sacrifice with you. Did you remember to bring your blood sacrifice? You had to bring an ox or a bull or a sheep or if you were poor, uh, maybe you might want to bring a, a dove. And if you were like me, when you finally got to the temple, get this, you ready? You weren't even allowed to go all the way inside. Did you know that? Because I'm a Gentile. And most of us are probably Gentiles. They had an outer court where the Gentiles were allowed to come. If you were Jewish, you could come a little bit further into the, one of the central courts. But get this, nobody except for the high priest and that but once a year was actually allowed to go into the holy of holies. Only the high priest and that but once a year. And if you were to ask somebody 900 BC, well, my goodness, if it's this hard to just get to worship, to get to the place where God's people worship, why would we even go at all? Well, if you put a mic in somebody's face and ask them that question, they would give you one answer because God is holy and he's worthy of our worship. That would be the answer. And so today, of course, we have a thousand reasons not to go to church uh, it's too far, it's too close, I don't know anybody there, I know everybody there, everybody knows me. The service is too long, the service is too short. I don't like hymns, I like only hymns. I don't like the liturgy, I like only liturgy. I don't like to stand up, I don't like to have to sit down. I don't like the pastor, he's too funny. I don't like the pastor, he's too serious. I don't like the pastor, he's too northern. I don't like the screen, I don't like not the screen. Of course we realize, we get the point, right? There's a thousand reasons why we can skip going to church. We could give a thousand reasons why we ought not to go to church and to find something better to do. Maybe the boat, maybe golf, maybe something on television. But what I want to do today is I want to talk about why we should. What is in it for us? What's in it for you to be part of a local body of Christ, the local Christian church? Why should we even care? Well, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, I've been doing a little mini-series, just three weeks, a little mini-series called The Covenant Household. Do you remember this? The Covenant Household. The word covenant in the Bible, of course, means the great promises of God that he gives us in the law and in the gospel. And it's, of course, our binding requirements to serve him in faithfulness. And a household in the New Testament meant uh, mom, it meant dad, it, it meant the children included. And if they had slaves or servants in those days, they would be included in the household as well. Uh, thank goodness we don't have slaves today. Amen. But the household was uh, the family unit. And so in the last couple of messages, uh, we've talked about five marks of the covenant household. And I'll just tick them off for you real quick. Number one, Jesus is Lord. Uh, number two, the covenant sign is upon the family. In the Old Testament, that was circumcision. In the New Testament, it is baptism. A third, that the word of God has the authority over the covenant household. Fourth, that it is led by a, a Jesus following head of household, normally dad, sometimes mom, sometimes grandma or grandpa as well. And then finally, that the covenant household is part of the bigger family, which is the church or the people of God. And so last week I broke out number three, the word of God for some closer examination. I want to do the same thing this week with that fifth point related to being part of the bigger family, the body of Christ. And so in the sermon this morning, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, hope you have your Bible still open to Hebrews 10. We're going to jump right back in it in a second. But what I'm going to give you is four reasons why believers ought to be part of of the local Christian assembly, why we should be part of the local Christian church. In other words, look, let's ask just a really modern, consumer-oriented question, what's in it for me? 
And I want to try to answer that this morning. So four reasons of what, well, four what's in it for me's from Hebrews chapter 10. Let's go back to the text, verse 19. Here's the first one. Why should I become part of the assembly, the local Christian church? Answer, verse 19, in my words, we come because Jesus has made a way for us to come. We come to him because Jesus has made it possible that we would come to God. Now look at this in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, pause right there. We come to him because he made a way for us to come. Now, I want you to notice in this verse that the author of Hebrews says that we have a new and living way that has been opened to us. What does he mean by that? Uh, well, in my opening little illustration, I hope I, point out, I hope I pointed out for you some of the differences uh, between New Testament worship and Old Testament worship. One of those differences now, there is not just one place in which we come to worship. Now there are many. In fact, everywhere, right? In, in the days of the Old Testament economy, of course, there was one place, the temple of God in Jerusalem. That was the place, the place, where people were required to come to offer holy worship to God. Nowadays, we can worship him anywhere. And by the way, aren't you glad? How many of you are glad, raise your hand, that you did not bring a bull, a goat, or a sheep to offer and sacrifice today? Isn't that convenient? Oh, thank goodness we don't have to bring our herds with us to sacrifice blood offerings for us to atone for our sins. Why do we not have to do that today, church? Because Jesus has already done that through his blood. He has opened for us a new way, a new and living way. That's why we don't have priests here. I'm not a priest. I'm a pastor. That's what the New Testament describes as the leaders of the Christian church. Now, everybody is a priest in the sense that we all live in service and worship to God, but we don't have to offer sac sacrifices anymore. Amen? And notice this. Look back at the text again. Confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Uh, in the Old Testament, that was the most holy place that the priest could only get, go into once a year to offer sacrifice on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. We don't do that anymore. Why? Because we can meet him anywhere. I, I can meet him in the church, and I, and, I, and I do every Lord's Day. I can meet him in the study when I pray back in there. I can meet him in my room when I do my devotions at night. I can meet him at the breakfast table. If you work, you can meet him at the, at the, in the conference lounge. You, you can meet him in the prisons if you're in prison. We can meet Christ everywhere. Praise God, amen? amen? But now here comes the objection. Somebody says, and this is a good objection, they say, wait a second. Okay, I'm tracking with you, Everhard. If we don't have to go to the temple anymore, then I can worship him anywhere, right? And I'm, I'm like, yeah, 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 that's it, yeah, that's it. So I don't need to come to church. I can worship him on the boat or the golf course or just watching a podcast or, or listening to the Joy FM at home. Why should I even bother then with meeting with everybody else? I can do this thing by myself. Can't I? Can't I? Here's my answer to that. You can, but it's not sufficient. Why? We'll go back to what it actually says in the Bible. Look at the, look at the plurals here. Therefore, brothers, there's a plural. Uh, we're a family here. We're the, we're the New Testament church. We're the, we're the covenant households. Brother, brothers is plural, and so is the word we, the pronoun there, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by his blood. And, and there's later, us, let us draw near, verse 22. So worship is always going to have a corporate or plural aspect to it, and I think that's part of our problem. As we get so individualistic with Christianity, we begin to think it's about me and JC, if you know what I mean, right? Listen, I know that at one point in your life, you looked into the television, and, you, and Jimmy Swagger, how many, how many of you are old enough to remember him? Jimmy Swagger, Jimmy Baker, he looked at you through the magic of television, he said, and he said to you, brother, Jesus died for you, and he meant just you, and you believed it, and I, I'll tell you what, it's true, but it's a partial truth. 
Because when Jesus died, yes, he died for you individually, but he also died for the people of God. He died for his elect people that he would come to redeem. In fact, I'm going to give you a little homework. You ready for this? I want you to find in your New Testament how many times it says that Jesus died for an individual. I found two. See how many you can find. The preponderance of references to Jesus' death are for us, plural, the people of God. And so there's always going to be a pluralistic aspect to holy worship. We can't forsake that. And how has he made it possible for us to come to him? Well, the answer is, and this is pretty, pretty rough stuff here, he did it through his flesh. You see that in verse 20? How did he open up that curtain? That's, again, a reference to the, the division between the holy place and the most holy place and the temple. How did Jesus open up that curtain? He opened it up for us through his flesh. In other words, it was his death on the cross, his death as atonement that made it possible for us, we're sinners, to come into the presence of a holy God. Now, now sometimes we'll pray prayers like this, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it, by the way. I'm just saying we did it last week. Sometimes you'll hear a prayer. How many of you heard this? Lord, thank you so much that we live in a free country that provides us the opportunity to come to you. Have you ever heard, of, ever heard a prayer like that? Fourth of July, Memorial Day, we pray prayers like that. Thank you, Lord, that this country allows us to come to your presence without fear of repercussions or, or, or antagonism from the government. Yes, but you know what? That freedom from our government would be absolutely meaningless, meaningless if Christ hadn't, first of all, made a way for us to come to the Father through his death and resurrection. So one of the reasons that we gather together as the New Testament church is because Jesus has made a way. He has opened a door for us to come, so let's come. All right, that's number one. Number two, let's go on. We come because he is worthy. Look at verse 21. We come because he is worthy. Read this. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold faithful, let us hold fast, verse 23, to the confession of our hope without wavering for, here, here's, here's the big part, for he who promised is faithful. Do you know why we come to gather together as a church to worship him? It's really simple. Because he's worthy. He is worthy of us to gather together as an assembly and to worship him. How many of you grew up in a church or a home in which you learned Westminster Shorter Catechism number one? You ever heard this? Let's drill it. What is the chief end of man? Answer? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's the motive for everything we do. Not just worship as the assembly, but that's the motive for everything we do is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So I don't know about you, but, but my motive for everything, you know, the reason I woke out of bed this morning is to glorify God and enjoy him. You? The reason I had my coffee this morning Coffee is good. I'm sorry, I got on, sorry, I got on that train. The reason I drink my coffee so that my body will be filled with energy is because God is worthy to be glorified and enjoyed. The reason I do everything, the reason I go to work, the reason I parent my kids, the reason I kiss my wife before we go to sleep at night is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. He is the central reason why we worship. Now, the fact that I buried this in point number two out of four, I don't want you to think that this is unimportant because this is huge. I just happen to be going in the order of the text that's in front of us. We worship because he is worthy to be worshipped. If you'll flip back with me just for a moment, let's do this quick. Go back to Psalm number 63. Can you do that? Psalm 63. Listen to the psalmist. This is David writing. Here's a man who's been captivated by the worth and the, and the majesty and the glory and the beauty of God. This man, you could just tell he loves God. Listen to this. 
Psalm 63, 1. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. And on he goes. This is a man, Psalm 63, David is consumed with the holiness and the worthiness and the beauty and the majesty of God. And that's the point of corporate worship on the Lord's Day or any other day for that matter, is that God be glorified. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be completely honest. Steel-toed boots here, folks. We have that completely backwards sometimes. We actually are so arrogant that we've come to believe that worship is about us. Well, I prefer this kind of music. Do you then? Didn't know we were singing to you. Well, I prefer this translation of the Bible. That's great. We're not reading for you. Well, I would prefer if the elders did this, or I would prefer if the praise band would do that, or I would prefer that the service be a little bit shorter, or I would prefer that the service would be longer, or I would prefer this kind of sermon. Guess what? Newsflash, folks. Worship is not about you, and thank goodness it is not about me. It is about one person and one person alone, and that is the holy, worthy God that we have come to proclaim. So our personal predilections and preferences and desires, those are irrelevant when we come to the church. We are here for his glory alone. And by the way, I love the fact that scripture reminds us here in Hebrews chapter 10 that it is he who is faithful to us. He, the Bible says, is faithful. How many of you can testify that God has been faithful to you at some point in your life? Amen, me too. He's faithful. That's why we come. That's why we love him. I don't know about you, but he has never let me down. He has never left me alone. He has never left me broken. He's never left me out on a limb somewhere. God has been there for me every day of my life. And if you've been following him for more than five minutes, he will prove that to you, that he is faithful. And therefore, once again, I conclude, he is worthy of our praise on Sunday mornings and every other day for that matter. Okay, so number one, uh, we come because Christ has made a way. Number two, we, become, we come because he is worthy. Number three, here we go. You ready? We come because we are commanded to come. Now somebody says, now Pastor Matt, you know that the Bible never says you have to go to church, right? The Bible doesn't say that. Or does it? Because I'm looking at 24 here, and this looks like a command to me. Let's, let's just go ahead and read this aloud. Let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. Now, that's a soft way to make a command, but it's a command. And we all realize, of course, that when, when we give a command— or in grammatical terms, it's called an imperative when you're telling somebody to do something. You can say it in so many words and it still be an imperative command. So for instance, I can say, I can tell my son, and I will tomorrow, I'll say, son, take out the garbage. And that's an imperative, it's a command. But I can do it a little bit softer than that. I can do it, I can, I can do it by using a, a double negative. I can say to my son, now son, don't neglect to take out the garbage, okay? Or don't forget, don't not take out the garbage. So I, so I can say it directly, do it, or I can say, don't not do it. But you realize, of course, that either way, I'm being pretty clear with my son. Garbage here, got to get to there, you're going to do it. Is that right? All right? Okay, so what we have here is an imperative, but it's a soft form. He says, let us, it's a, kind of a gentle way, let us... Consider how to stir one another up, not neglecting to meet together. So, in other words, meet together. That's the force of that expression, okay? So, if you're a parent, 
or a grandparent, you've probably tried this, giving an imperative before, and you were probably met with, with a little objection, a little one-word answer, why? You ever heard that? Do this. Why? And, and because you're a good mom, you're a good dad, you're a good grandparent, you replied, because I said so. <laughs> and that's totally sufficient if you're, if you're the authority. Take out the garbage. Why? Because I said so, and I'm, and I'm the authority. Now, now, sometimes, though, because we're kind and we're gentle and, and we love each other and we love our kids, sometimes we will, even though they ask why, we could say, because I said so, sometimes we go ahead and we explain it anyways. Well, see, son, you see, the garbage needs to get out today because the truck only comes but twice a week. And if we don't take out the garbage, then the garbage begins to stink. And so you need to get your little hiney out there and get that can to the curb. And, that, and you explained it, and that's, and that's good. And so sometimes we should explain commands, and sometimes we don't need to. If I say, son, take out the garbage, he doesn't need to say why. If I say, son, uh, stop putting Fritos in your sister's ear, he should just say, yes, sir. If I say, son, stop shaving the dog or whatever, he should just stop shaving the dog. But sometimes there's a good explanation for it, and we actually get a good explanation for why we should meet together. It's right here in the text. Look back at it one more time. Verse 24, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. So what is the why for meeting together? Because that's how we encourage each other. I defy any solo Christian out there to try to apply verse 24 and 25 to your life without brothers and sisters in Christ. You can't do it. And a whole lot of other verses you wouldn't be able to fulfill. So we meet together because we need each other. That's the big E on the, on the I chart here. We meet together because we need each other. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories First of all, sound team, if you could put up the picture of Dale McEwen up here for just a second, if we have that picture available. This is Dale. Now, you should know Dale. He's in church today. If you've been around Faith Church for a while, Dale is our, our, our photographer. He is the guy who captures all of the beautiful images, all of the pictures of your baptisms and uh, your, your communions and the pictures of mission teams and the pictures of a youth group shooting kids out of cannons and things. He captures all that stuff on film. And he's been with us for, for a while, and recently his hand started to act kind of weird, and his speech got a little bit strange one day, and so we all thought, it's probably a stroke. And Dale went in for some tests, and he got an MRI, and then they, 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 they did a biopsy, and, and what we found is that our brother Dale, that we love so dearly here at Faith Church, he's got cancer, a form of cancer that's growing in his brain right now, all right? So we're praying for Dale. Dale loves us. We love Dale. And I was talking to Dale on the phone the other day. I, I called to encourage him, and then he ended up encouraging me. And Dale said something I'll never forget. Listen to this. He said, this is a direct quote, Faith Church is the best thing that has ever happened to me in my entire life. Isn't that awesome? How would he have that encouragement if not for the local assembly of the church? How would we have that encouragement that we just heard right now if Dale wasn't part of us? Okay? Here's Audrey. Look at Audrey. Last week we talked about her. She's our financial secretary. Last week I gave a plea for her. I don't know if you know this, but uh, somebody close to her and her family died tragically in a car crash. Mom and dad both died in a car crash. And so Audrey and her husband, Mike, they're the next of kin for four grandchildren that have just now come into her custody legally, along with the other grandchild that she already has in her custody legally for a total of five and so we put up a little video saying, hey, Audrey needs a new home. Audrey needs a refrigerator and a freezer. Audrey's going to need a bed and some other stuff. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't but 24 hours later, we already had the house thing figured out. How does that happen? That's the beauty of God working through the local assembly of the Christian church, encouraging one another, stirring each other up 
to good works. And I don't know about you, but I can testify from my own life that the day that we rolled in from Akron to Brooksville, the church was already here at our house ready to help move us in. All right? They were there for me. And when we adopted Simone five years ago, we had a little family situation and Simone came into our lives. This church adopted her into the family as much as we adopted her. And, and when, my ne- when my wife had a neck surgery a couple years ago and she was in pain, this church was here for me. I can testify to you that this church is a loving assembly of believers. And if you'll stick with us, I promise you, give us the chance to love you. We will. You're going to feel it. And so what I want you to do right now is I want you to picture in your mind, you ready? There's some Christians knocking on a door. And on the other side of the door is another family from the church. Uh, maybe a baby has been born. Be a good thing. Maybe uh, somebody lost a job. Maybe, maybe somebody died in their family. But either way, one Christian family from Faith Church is, is coming to the home of another and, and as they meet in the doorway, a casserole is passed from the visitors into the hands of the people in the home. Now pause it right there. Can you see that? Casserole is being passed as a token of love and friendship. My question to you is this. Who is being blessed in that freeze frame moment as the casserole goes from one family to the next? Who's being blessed? Both. And if you're not part of a local Christian church, how will you have that experience of the church loving each other and stirring each other up to good works? That's how the Lord designed it, okay? So third is we come because we are commanded to come. And the reason we're commanded to come is because that's how we encourage each other. Now there's one more reason here in this passage, and that's in the last verse that we studied together. Look at verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. Now, I love that part because that's the, that's the apostolic elbow being thrown in the pew right there. Do you all receive that? How many of you throw the apostolic elbow at the person sitting next to you sometime? You, you, I mean, I love this. I think this is actually so winsome here that the, the apostle, the writer of this book, actually says, not, to, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So it's a little guilt trip. It's it's biblical, all right? It's biblical. But there's something deeper. And that is in this concluding line here. All the more as the day is drawing near. Now, Bible scholars, what is the day being referred to here in this passage? What is it? The day of the Lord, or the return of Christ. That is the day. I love Martin Luther. He used to say, I have two days on my calendar, today and the day. And if, we're, if I'm reading this right, what the author of Hebrews is telling us here is, as the day gets closer and closer, we ought to be more and more united as the believing body. Do you see that? Okay. Not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging each other, and all the more. So in other words, the church is to be more close, more intimate, more passionate about our mission, more conscientious of the Great Commission, more and more in tune with our sanctification, more and more differentiated from the world. I'm not, I'm not saying that, that we never exchange ideas with the world, that we don't have opportunities to evangelize the world. Of course we do. But, but as the day arrives, as the day comes closer and closer, the church is to be more and more sewn together, tied together, united, concerned for one another, loving each other, caring for each other. Why? Because the day keeps getting closer and and closer and closer every single day. It's interesting. If you think about it chronologically, we are closer to the day than any apostle who ever wrote a book in our Bible. Just chronologically, isn't that right? We are closer to the day 
than Martin Luther or John Calvin or the Puritans. We are closer now to the day than when the pilgrims came on the Mayflower bringing with them their Geneva Bibles ready to bring the Great Commission into the new world. We are closer now to the day than when Billy Graham was in his heyday preaching revival circuits all around the world. We are closer now to the day than any other Christian generation that has ever lived. Now, there will perhaps be generations that are closer to the day than us. I don't know how long the Lord will tarry, but the point is this. As the day approaches, the church is to be more and more unified and pure in their doctrine and passionate about our duty to evangelize the world. little closing application before we close out. There's a, there's a graphic I have. I want you to imagine the church as a series of concentric circles. Can you picture this? A little green graphic up here. There it is. Now, where are you on this graphic? Because every church, not just faith, but every church has this kind of concentric circle effect. There is, of course, on the very fringe, there are visitors. Some of you are visiting for the first time today. We love you. Thank you for coming. We're glad you're here. Uh, every church has on the fringes some people, you know, the, we call them creasters, the Christmas and Easter folk, the people that come around every blue moon, you know, when, you know whenever, a, whenever a meteorite hits the planet, they end up showing up. They're the fringe folks. We love you. We're glad you're here. But what I want you to do is consider just moving in a little bit closer to the center. Okay? And some of you are... You're regular attenders. You're here twice a month. You're here once a month. You're here three times a month. You're not involved in anything necessarily, but you're here. You're part of us. We love you. So glad you're here. Here's what I want you to do. This year, I want you to move closer to the center one notch, and I want you to begin serving somewhere in the church. Okay, you say, where? Well, nursery, choir, youth, missions, Thailand. I got a whole bunch of ideas. Talk to me after church. We'll plug you in, okay? Okay. Now, some of you are already servants. You're already showing up to the nursery a couple times a month. You've already done a couple things, a little this or that. I want you to move in another step and come into leadership somehow. I want you to begin leading a ministry, t carrying your vision into the church. I want you to begin leading something, okay? So wherever you are on that concentric circle, I want you to consider taking one step in this year, okay? The fall is a great time to rededicate our lives. School starts over, uh, jobs kick into our gears, vacations, all that stuff kind of winds down. The fall is a great time to rededicate our lives. My challenge to you is move one step closer in the circle. Could you do that? Some of you say, I don't know, Pastor Matt. I don't know about this church thing. I don't know. Final thought. Well, how about heaven? Would you like to be in heaven? How do we go to heaven? We go to heaven by believing in Christ, by repenting of our sins, by trusting in his work and the gospel. But what is heaven? You ever read Revelation? What do they do there? So, let's see. They gather together. They worship in song. Somebody gives a message, worthy is the lamb who was slain, etc. Okay? And they worship the ever-living Christ. Sounds a whole lot like a church to me. Only this time, instead of the local Christian assembly, it's going to be the church with the capital C, the global universal assembly. And I ask you simply this, if that sounds good to you, but little church, local church doesn't, something's just a little bit amiss. Because little church, little c, is designed by God to prepare us for big C, great church in heaven where we will gather before the throne and we will look upon the face of the lamb and we will give him worship and a service that will never end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We confess. God, we admit it. I admit it. Sometimes I've made this thing about church about me, and it's not. And I confess that, and I repent of that. God, I want to be a part of the church, the beautiful assembly, because you are the head and the king and the Christ of your church. And I want to be where you are. And I love you and thank you. 
In your holy name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and receive the benediction as we go. The elders will be available to you after church to pray with you. They'll be right up here. I'll be back there shaking hands and greeting folks, but the elders will be up here. If you want to pray with somebody, maybe today is the day that you become a Christian. And maybe today is the day that you step one ring closer to the center of the heart of the church. If, if that's, the, that's the commitment you want to be uh, making, there will be an elder to talk about that with you. If you want prayers for healing, we believe that God heals. And so come and the elders will pray for you. We love you. We're glad you're here. So let's receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift his beautiful countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Hey, I love you so much. Thanks for coming. I'll see you next week.